come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie curation experience. That's right. Where we're going to guide you through a whole bunch of movies week after week, and we're going to tell you whether or not you should watch it. And we'll do a little bit of a deep dive on it. These are the internet radio superstars. Holly. John. Michaela. And I'm Colin. Uh, Colin, stop relabeling us all the time. Well, what'd I do? Your internet radio superstars. Well, I mean, and again, I know we're out of order, but you got to do us a favor and go over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button because all of that helps us become the fastest growing podcast in the universe that's right tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by michaela uh speaking of universes uh what movie did we watch tonight well on the third stop of our blockbuster failure tour of the summer we how many stops 20- are there there's, there's one more and it okay. i think it's the like best movie of them all so that's why i'm saving it for last because i'm hoping we can watch it together but um tonight we watched 2013's after earth uh, directed by, uh, technically M. Night Shyamalan, but for real, Will Smith. What do you mean? He was actually <laughs> calling the shots day to day? Yes. Get yeah. the fuck out. This entire movie was Will Smith's idea. He wrote the script. He said, hey, M. Night Shyamalan, I've always wanted to work with you. Shyamalan thought that meant, hey, write a movie for me and I'll be in it. But what he really meant was like, hey, show up and give me a thumbs up on the set. And that's about it. So, and I don't know if you guys noticed, this does not feel like an M. Night Shyamalan movie at all. No, it doesn't. I was going to say that the, uh, I mean, Shyamalan has a fairly distinct visual, you know, and, and uh, like a cadence. Of, uh, there's air in between his line deliveries and stuff like that in his movies. This movie feels like it could have been made by anybody. I, I didn't exactly. feel the hand of, and his, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the one he did before this was The Last Airbender. This is the low, low, low point of M. Night Shyamalan's career. Up until this, it was The Happening, Lady in the Water, The Last Airbender, and then this. And this was the one, if memory serves, because, I mean, I remember thinking at the time, both Last Airbender and this one, I don't believe, like, pushed the idea that it was an M. Night Shyamalan movie. This was a guy who still, like, when he came on the scene with The Sixth Sense, which I think is, like, maybe his third movie or something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's at yeah, least the second. Yeah, what, Praying with Anger and Wide Awake were before that? Right. They were kind of like uh, indie dramas, and then he hit the big mm-hmm. time with The Sixth Sense, which was basically like a Twilight Zone kind of riff and forever established M. Night Shyamalan as the guy who gives you the fuck, the twist at the end of the movie. Um, and so then it was all like an M. Night Shyamalan movie. So what happened? Why by the time we get to Last Airbender, which I think that movie is the highest grossing movie that he has ever made. Um, so even but everybody though, hated it. <laughs> but uh, apparently tons of kids saw it. So he's sitting there laughing his whole way to the bank <laughs> as we're sitting there going uh, like, not exactly like he i mean i don't think any director wants to like have that much of a failure of a movie like people yeah. went to see it but it is reviled and like the people that were in it even like talk so much shit about that movie but i i don't know if you guys remember the marketing for after earth but his name was not anywhere on this movie they yeah, kept that no. a secret i think it was the first the first time like it was downplayed for last mm-hmm. airbender but it was completely absent from this one um, I, I had I had no idea until you guys said it last week. Oh wow, really? I had no idea. Yeah. Do you remember what led to that uh, situation? Why? Yes, I do. So, do you guys remember when Devil came out, the movie that he executive produced around like 2010 ish? Yes, I do. I, I like that movie. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not a bad movie. But do you remember yeah. in the trailer when it said it was produced by him? Did you ever experience an audience reaction to that? <laughs> yeah, it was part of his. Uh, what wasn't it going to be part of his Night Chronicles? Wasn't this like the the first of a couple movies that he was supposed to produce? Um, yeah, coming out. And yeah, it was around the time where it just like, oh. But I remember saying- the audience audibly groaning and like a couple people booed when like the trailer for Devil came on and it said executive produced by M Night Shyamalan. People were so over him. Wow. He was just a punchline at that point. 
Well, what? I don't, I don't think I've ever. That, I don't think I've ever experienced a reaction like that just to a name pop up on a screen for a trailer. Oh, like, I have. It, yeah. it was that's intense. <laughs> but what led to that? I mean, do you remember? I mean, obviously, it took four bad movies in a row. That's what it is, man. The happening was really hyped because that was supposed to be his first R-rated movie. Yeah. Right. And woof, and then to follow it up with Lady in the Water and the Last Airbender. Yeah. Ugh. And I don't think the village was particularly well received either. You kind of got the idea with M Night Shyamalan. It was because of the twist thing, right? It's like you're expecting the twist. What's he going to do? And then they became like these blatantly obvious things. Where it's a like, gimmick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he, he became the gimmick guy. So I, mean, I, don't, I, always, I always thought the village got more hate than it deserved. I I, I don't dug, like that movie. I agree. I, I, I kind of <laughs> dug that. I kind of dug that movie. I'm a that big fan great. of like the first whatever hour of I it. Like it's like vibe. really good. I like the yeah. vibe. Yeah. And the people. Do you, you like it because it's shot by Roger Deakins? Oh, and that shot too. The hell That's right. Yeah. I still like this. Some, some great moments in that movie. Yeah, and the Where performances talking on the front are good. Porch and everything. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but and then well, I mean, okay. So after Earth, uh, I'm assuming you're going to tell us that it would it was not a box office success. It was not. Um, I did some uh, comparing uh, other Will Smith movies because this is much more of a Will Smith movie than it is an M Night Shyamalan movie. Um, just for some perspective, The Pursuit of Happiness made three hundred million dollars. Like a drama made three hundred million dollars. Oh, wow! This movie made two hundred and forty. It only made sixty million domestic, though. Ooh, what was the budget? One hundred and thirty million dollars. Jesus, uh, it looks yikes. expensive, you know, in uh, in the way that the, these type of big science fiction movies do. Um, uh-huh. That actually kind of surprises me that the that the uh, box office was that. Uh, well, I mean, Pursuit of Happiness. So maybe maybe that was you had the you know novelty of seeing Will Smith and his son. Uh, Jaden being in a movie together for the first time, right? Um, when was uh, Karate Kid? Because Jaden for was a little before this, but after Pursuit of Happiness, yes. Okay, so so Hollywood did at some point try to make Jaden Smith uh, the next Will Smith, I guess. You know, to have well, him follow his you father's say that, footsteps. Colin, that's what like almost all my research is about. So Will Smith has famously <laughs> said. I thought you had um, uh, props there for a minute. No, I know. I thought. I thought you were pulling. I thought you were pulling out. I thought you were pulling out a binder or something. I was like, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to turn the camera and show you my red string wall about Will Smith and his kid's career. That's what I thought. I'm just like, oh, what's she reaching for? <laughs> no, I'm just throwing toys at my cat that won't stop pulling at the door that I have closed. Um, oh. But so Will Smith has he's kind of walked this back since then. But he said a couple years back, maybe like a decade ago, that. He the only way he knows how to help his kids professionally is if they want to become actors. He's basically like, if you want to become an actor, I can help you. If you want to do anything else, I can't really help you. And a lot of people kind of took that as like, if you want my approval as a father, you need to become an actor. Um, So Will Smith bought Annie for his daughter, Willow, and he was going to play Daddy Warbucks and she was going to play Annie and she refused to do it. So him and Jada just became executive producers and it went to Benzene Wallace and Jamie Foxx. He bought the Karate Kid for Jaden. And I mean, at the age Jaden was, I'm sure that sounds awesome. You're like, yeah, sure. Why the hell not? You're a kid. You get to play in movie sets, you know. Um, That was a huge success, made a fuck ton of money, was fairly well received. Then this is like Will Smith. After Earth is Will Smith being like, I'm going to pass the torch. I'm going to pass the torch to you. You're going to be the second coming of me. This is going to launch your career. Jaden Smith just did not want to do it. I don't, if you guys couldn't tell by his performance in this movie. Um, He was about 14 years old while he made this. And about a year after this movie came out, he actually filed for an emancipation from his parents. So, (laughs) oh, wow. You're not putting me in movies, Dad. He he goes into the court and he's like, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the court, exhibit A, after Earth. (laughs) <laughs> Look like, what they made me it. do. Emancipated. His <laughs> argument was actually that he makes so much money he could independently support himself and didn't need to, uh, to be under the guardianship of parents, mm. which is not an invalid argument. Um, he was denied emancipation ship, and I think that they have like since repaired their relationship. But yeah, Will Smith put a lot of pressure on his kids to be actors, and neither one of them wanted to do it. Like now, Jaden Smith runs like a uh, food truck that he gives out free food to the homeless in L.A. and Skid Row, and like he does stuff like that. And I, I kind of get it because if you grow up being the kids of Will Smith, and like your whole life is already kind of like 
crazy like a movie, why would would you want to do this? Yeah, and there's, uh, you know, you're financially set. I guess that's the other thing, too. Right. I mean, I assume at some point his yeah. parents were like, you got to get out and make your own, you know, way. But wasn't, didn't he, uh, didn't he become a musician at some point? Or was that Willow? Willow has Willow. Okay. Willow's never, has she been in a movie? I went my hair back and forth. I went my hair back and forth. I went my hair <laughs> Nope, they bought Annie for her, and she refused to do it, so they okay. pass it on. So she is currently a recording artist. Uh, um, uh, Jaden is a community activist. They're helping. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Will and Smith. famous for wearing a white Batman suit to, to Kim Kardashian's wedding, I believe. If As you remember you that do, incident you know, way back in the I mean, day. The rich aren't like that, I guess, us, right? They're eccentric. <laughs> I guess the reason why I brought this movie is because I think it's really interesting to look at it through the lens of Jaden Smith is playing a character that's desperately trying to win the approval of his father, when in real life, that's exactly what's happening to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, like, that doesn't make the movie good, but it is, like, the context around the movie is much more interesting than the actual movie. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that uh, Will Smith, he went on to do uh, Gemini Man, which was the latest, uh, well, not the latest, he was in Bad Boys for Life, I think, which is going to be like the highest grossing movie of 2020. But uh, yeah. a Gemini Man, I think, was the one of the lowest grossing movies of 2019, where he played opposite himself as a young person, and so, so he couldn't get Jaden to do it, I, I assume, or whatever. Maybe the thought never occurred to them, but they just de-aged Will Smith and made him young Will Smith. That movie's not awful, but it's not very good either. Uh, no, it feels doesn't about, really be awful, but it looked like they were more. Uh, uh, they liked the technology more than they liked the story. Yeah, that movie right. it felt very cookie cutter. Like it was a '90s movie that somehow got displaced in time and came out. They're doing the, that a lot lately. In 2019, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the this is actually the only film of Shyamalan's that he didn't write the script and he didn't cameo in. I thought he was a credited writer at the end. It was Gary Wooda and M. Night Shyamalan. Right, but as the... he didn't write the... It wasn't his original idea. Okay, okay, there you... Okay. Oh, he really? He did a pass on the script. Even uh, Last Airbender, he wrote that? Mm-hmm. Okay, he, well, I mean, he adapted it from the original anime, but... Yeah. Well, M. Night Shyamalan did redeem himself. He eventually got a deal with Blumhouse and did uh, The Visit, the found footage horror movie, and then... I stand by that movie. And then he did Split. I thumbs down. I like the visit. Yeah, I didn't like the visit, but I I loved Split. And then I was like, M Night Shyamalan's back. He's doing M Night Shyamalan movies. And then he made Glass, and I will never forgive him. Never. <laughs> but isn't that the most Shyamalan thing ever to undo all of the goodwill you earned? Yeah, he's in my mind. He's <laughs> yeah. back where he, he was. It was like you came back and then you that's shit the, it all away. That's, what, that's the twist. <laughs> yeah. Bam. I thought I was gonna make a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you can hear us talk about both of those movies on I think our last two best movies of the year episodes. If you go back through the <laughs> catalog, so. um, okay. So After Earth is not based on a video game called Three Thousand Million Years After Earth. That was the original title, wasn't it? Of the movie, I don't know. I think they, sure. I think it was it originally like, AE. It was uh, like three million years AE. I think, which is a knock on uh, what uh, one million years BC. And then eventually they said, "No, let's just call it After Earth." Um, okay, so where what's the genesis of this uh, of this movie? Where'd this idea come from? This is all Will Smith's idea, which is where I think a lot of the Scientology stuff comes into play too. Well, he he had watched an episode of uh, the TV series called "I Shouldn't Be Alive," um, where a father and son like got into like a really bad car wreck, and the dad's legs were broken, and the son had to like go for help through the wilderness. And he saw that and was like, "I can write a movie like that with me and my son." And After Earth. But originally, the way I heard it, it was supposed to be a story like set on Earth. With a father and, the, and his son where, you know, yeah, dad's legs broken, kids got to go off into the wilderness and do something. And then somebody somewhere got the idea is we should set it 3,000 years or 3 million years, whatever, 3,000 years in the future. And then it yeah, became a huge science fiction movie. Influence. Okay. So I don't have evidence, but I'm pretty sure because look at the Scientology movies we have. They're all like this. Well, I mean, also, I mean, one of the reasons I like Will Smith as an actor is like, I, I think he's a, he's a nerd. 
he loves uh, movies with uh, creatures and monsters, Independence Day and Men in, Men in Black, and he likes action right. movies. I mean, you right. know, it's rare. He does do dramas, but I feel like, you know, he is the, the kid inside of him is cutting loose whenever he gets to be in a, a big scale uh, science fiction action movie. Which this uh, wants to be, except the irony is, is that Will Smith is sidelined for the entire movie with the broken legs. Uh. <laughs> well, isn't the like that's OK. This is the biggest problem with this movie, right, is that when I go to see a Will Smith movie, I'm buying that ticket because I know he's like he has this natural charisma that is unique to him. Right. And, and this away. movie, he is emotionless and cut off and it could be anybody. It does. You know, that's. That's what's the, probably the biggest offense of this movie, I think. Yeah, he's a literal cipher. His name is Cipher Reigns, ladies and gentlemen. Cipher Reigns. Cipher Rage. Rage. Oh, it's even better. R A I G E. Uh, yeah. Uh, a cipher is, of course, a character that has no personality, so you can project on it. So, well, he's a military guy, right? So, this is the whole idea is that he's a very stoic, uh, by the numbers. Um, hardcore military dad. He's a legend in the uh, the the Earth Defense Force or whatever of uh, the year. Was it the year three thousand? Whatever it is. Yeah, it's three thousand seventy one. I think is what the year's supposed to be. This movie sets up like an info dump, like right off the bat, which just like was, Jonah Hex. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if this is a good thing when movies do this, where they do their world building, and you're like, okay, this is uh, kind of. We're told that um, basically uh, mankind made the Earth uninhabitable. So, of course, everybody on Earth took to the stars and they found a new planet. And it was called Nova Prime. And um, but on Nova Prime, there are monsters called Ursas. Am I got this right? Correct. That are bred to hunt and kill humans uh, by because detecting- aliens brought them there. Oh, okay. Because this was oh, said aliens created these to like rid planets of humans. Oh, so that's why this is supposed to be like an ongoing, like you know, trilogy or something. The scope would get bigger with the next movie, and we'd yep. actually meet the the aliens that made the Ursas. Okay. Yeah, in that really quick info dump, which I don't blame you if you've missed any of yeah, that. that went- there was like a quick shot of like the aliens dropping them down on the planet. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, yeah, I missed that completely. I've seen this twice now, so. <laughs> okay, so they are bred by aliens to uh, wipe humans off the planet, kind of like in Prometheus or something where they, yep. okay. Um, the Ursas, what would you say? What kind of creatures are these? Or does it matter? Well, they don't have eyes. They don't see. They're predator like, dogs again, goddammit. It's kind of like the, the quiet place things, except yeah. sound its smell. Yeah. So, but this is, I mean, I, I get that this is setting up, this actually seems like the most M night Shyamalan thing of the whole, uh, concept to me was that we're going to make a movie about conquering your fear. Ergo, we are going to make a monster that literally detects you because by your fear, Mm -hmm. like he thinks in simple kind of terms like that, that sometimes like break your, you know, like, I can't go there, M. Night. That's too on the nose. It's too obvious. Right. It's too juvenile. It's, it's too much. <laughs> yeah. We're not too enough. Much, I think too little. Yeah. yeah. He does like dumb stuff like that. Yeah. So the Ursas hunt you by, they can't see, of course. I mean, because why not? Uh, they were, I mean, why an alien race would breed a, uh, you know, a, 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 a carnivorous creature killing machine that can't hunt by sight you know or what okay so they hunt by smelling your fear um so jaden smith is uh, a cadet right he's following in his father's footsteps he's in this uh, military earth defense force or whatever right trying to become a Mm -hmm. ranger what is it what so i mean well i guess we know what that means right that just basically means a soldier of some type right Mm mm-hmm um, but his dad is a legend because he has a special ability. And what's that? And what's it called? And how does it work? It's called ghosting. ghosting. It's called what? Not the ghosting we ghosting. know. <laughs> ghosting. Yeah, it's not the dating type of ghosting. It's I know not some that. people who have that superpower as well. Yeah, I was like, it's not the one I'm all too familiar with. It's not that one. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it, it's um it's it's very it's almost similar to like a term like going clear it's yeah. almost like it's the same type of language um it's it's when you completely have the ability to control your sense of fear and you can just shut it off and will smith is the best at it he's so shut off from his fear that he's cut off from all of his emotions entirely there you go this becomes the Zena lesson. would be proud. Yeah, he is the most clear person, right? Because he has no emotions. He has yeah. no past traumas. He has no thetans. They're all gone. So how do you, um, oh, I know we're reading all the Scientology stuff into this because Will Smith is, uh, he is a Scientologist. Well, I assume once a Scientologist, always a Scientologist, he right? He will not confirm nor deny whether or not he's a Scientologist, but his wife is one. He's donated a lot of money. He built a school that hires Scientologist teachers. When asked about it, he says that he just likes to research all religions, um, but there's a lot of Scientology language and thought in this movie. And it's it's not, I wouldn't call this a propaganda film because it's not very overt. It's pretty subtextual. For that, you need like Battlefield you know Earth, right? Scientology, you can notice it. Okay. Yeah. Battlefield it's Earth is Battlefield, the propaganda no, movie? No, that's way more overt. Okay. And look how that, look how many people joined Scientology because of Battlefield Earth. I mean, yeah, it's I just mean, the thing is you don't build a school and hire teachers of Scientology if you're not involved with the church, you know? Yeah. So, um, and I guess that's the goal of Scientology is to purge yourself, become the perfect human, right? A yep. perfect, most self-actualized version of yourself by purging all of your uh, worldly attachments so you're right here in the now all the time. Well, it's it's overcoming all, because like... That's this is another thing like the volcano in this movie. That's big symbolism in Scientology, too. Like it's on the cover of Dianetics. That's where we be they believe all of our past like traumas are stored. And the idea of Scientology is that like once you get yeah. over your past traumas and like this collective shared subconscious, that's when you become clear. OK. All right, then. Well, right. OK, so that, we were saying that that's a buried subtext. There's also a thematic subtext subtext. And it's referenced in the movie. All of these uh, films that um, that refuse to do heavy lifting on their own uh, always kind of lean on a, a classical work of literature that's supposed to be like, you're familiar with this. This has the theme <laughs> that we're going for. So we'll just reference the classic thing and you'll get what it's shorthand, right? For saying it, you'll get it. What's yeah, the, what, what does it mean in this movie, Colin? <laughs> Okay, well, the book is uh, Moby Dick is referenced several times, right? The kids read Moby Dick. His dad loved Moby Dick. His daughter, uh, who died in a Ursa attack, uh, that's played by Zoe Kravitz, shows up in the movie in the flashbacks. Um, yeah, because I was like, you know, usually when you do Moby Dick references, Star Trek does this pretty well. They Man, they lean fucking heavy on that book in Star Trek. I wonder how many sales sure of Moby Dick has happened because of Star Trek, but... Uh, it's usually about obsession, right? That I am so obsessed with something that I'm going to follow it right over the fucking cliff and it's going to lead to my doom, right? Or right. it's the, well, I, that is the great white whale. I'm going to pursue that thing that injured me uh, even when it's bad for my health. This movie really doesn't do that or I didn't see that theme coming through. Yeah, That so, seemed like that happened before this movie, right? Like if Will Smith went on that journey, it already happened. It may okay. You're, you're saying like if his the, white whale is becoming like the best ghost ever, we, that already happened. Well, I, I, isn't there focus more the kid's white whale though? Isn't that it's it's his journey? So it's about him overcoming like his own but perception they say it's of Will himself. Favorite book. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, the whole went, his white whale is his father's approval and his, and his opinion of himself versus what he thinks his father thinks of him. So his father is his own white whale, essentially. Hmm. I mean, this, right? this is entirely possible. I mean, I, I'm not entirely seeing the connective thing there. I mean, I assume that there's also... I don't think it's connected well. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah that's what I think vague. they were going for. The but book's then, only brought up in reference to Will Smith and like Zoe Kravitz talks about how she learned like his favorite passage or whatever from it. And like, I don't know, it just, it seems to pop up at the most random times. Yeah. But I mean, basically yeah. it's uh, the only thing I could take from it is, you know, unless you look at it from like, well, it's nature, right? Uh, nature itself, the whale or, you know, just the sea. 
being nature is, you know, like this thing that's always trying to kill, you know, it's like, you're always going to get, um, you know, it's man versus nature, man versus natural adversity and stuff like that. It's like, well, okay, that's what the whole movie is about, I guess. But I don't know. It's a metaphor, a metaphor, an allegory that doesn't actually, I don't think it landed <clears throat> in this movie. I didn't, I don't know. That's no, just me. I, th- I think, I think Will Smith had a very specific idea in his head of what the allegory meant and i think he thinks it came across or at least in the making of it thought that it was but i don't think it actually came across the way he intended at all it feels like there's a lot of scenes missing from this movie um not necessarily once they land on earth but like the things that happened before and after that feel very choppy Mm-hmm. Well, you say they land on Earth. Um, I mean, I guess that's the big. Uh, de- what the se- the dramatic setup is that basically Jaden Smith doesn't get doesn't graduate to Ranger class. So ergo, he's possibly a disappointment to his father. Um, uh, Will Smith's wife says, you know, it's like, well, you got to do something with your kid because he looks up to you, and you know, this is a big deal. So he says, okay, we're going to go off on vacation. Are they going fishing? I don't know. They're going to some planet because that's what you do. You don't go They're on your transferring own. Transferring the Ursa to another planet. <clears throat> Remember, they have the Ursa and cargo. Oh, that's right. It's a military thing, and he's yeah. bringing his kid mm-hmm. along. Okay. He's, yeah, he's on a mission. Yeah. Right. They have one Ursa on a ship with uh, Tormund Giant Spain. It shows up in this movie. He's there. Um, that's from Game His role Thrones, was too. supposed to be a lot bigger. It's all on the cutting room floor. Okay. Did he survive? And they made the... him cut his beard and his hair for this. Ouch. Oh, this is lame. Before Game of yeah, Thrones, Yeah, Jaden right? Smith was like, that's not necessary. And then they made him do it anyways. And for, for this, for like, what, five minutes of on screen time? Of this movie. <laughs> of this yeah. movie, yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, I mean, you're getting paid. It's a big movie. Will Smith's in it. That means it's going to get seen. This will lead to other parts. Uh, actors do crazy things. But they, I know, I'm I mean, just saying, it must be heartbreaking, though, than to realize yeah. his role got cut down to five minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't blame him at all. It just sucks for him. Yeah. Um, but their ship in route to their destination encounters a, uh asteroid storm, which damages the ship, and they have to land it. Uh, I like the way they use travel, like as a, was that a verb? Travel me there. Travel there, you yeah. know, whatever. Um, I suppose travel talk, is, is what <laughs> it's future talk. I was going to say travel, just like how in demolition word? man, they say conveyance. Yeah. Um, well, so they end up getting damaged and they have to crash land on the closest planet and <gasps> it's earth. You don't want to go there. It's like a class D planet or whatever. It's F type or demon class or they whatever. Said it was illegal to land. Yeah. Cause it is inhospitable to humans. <clears throat> so they crash land. Will Smith and Jaden are the only ones left alive. Will Smith is irreparably damaged. His legs are broken. And Jaden is going to have to go out and get uh, the MacGuffin, which is a transmitter that's in the second half of the ship that's now separated by a couple hundred miles or something like that. He's got to trek through. 100 kilometers. Okay, 100 kilometers. That's right, because it's the future. It's like 60-ish miles. metric. What do you think about the future, uh, the, the, the way the future looks in this movie? Well, not not so much I Earth. Mean, I'm talking about like the uh, the civilized world that we leave at the beginning of the of the film. Why is everything curtains? There's a lot of honeycomb. Honeycomb. I saw uh, design and patterns in there. Curtains and flowing gauze and no right angles and everything smooth. No solid and, walls. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. It's a look I guess that I haven't seen before, but um, yeah. but I also everything some, seems flimsy. Yeah, because I was wondering, like, they, they don't have uh, viewing ports on the side of this space to, uh, spaceship. It's more like a plastic uh, honeycomb everything, pattern. Everything looks like it's made out of bamboo. Yeah, it's very, yeah. so they're going for an organic look or something yeah, like organic. that. Um, I mean, it's interesting, but I always think that this is the problem with a lot of these science fiction movies. They call them science fiction, but they're not really about the science or the fiction, you know, in that regard. I mean, they're not about scientific concepts. Uh, they're more just, it's an action movie that where the art department gets to go like, well, we got to come up with something new that hasn't been seen before. And guys start doing drawings and all that stuff and things are getting approved. And it's like, boom, here's a new look for, you know, it's like, okay. But every movie they go to then gives you that kind of stimulation of, you know, like, oh, well, there's a future I haven't seen before. But if you're not serving some kind of, you know, 
uh, purpose well, an, or an idea that kind of, um, you know, engages your brain in some way. Right. Then it's like, okay, but you're in service of what you could have done this for a lot less money and had the exact same movie. But yeah, I seen them. Yeah. They've glued, uh, uh, McDonald's containers, to walls. And I've got the idea. So you don't have to go this far. <laughs> yeah. To what was it? 130 million or whatever yeah. we're talking. 130 million was the budget. Yeah. And that's like, that's a, that's the production, not the marketing. So who knows how much the marketing costs? Cause I remember seeing trailers for this constantly. Yeah. So it's, they always say it's like double the budget or half. So it's either 50 to a hundred million just on marketing probably alone. Yep. Um, Here's my question. And this, like the whole movie kind of hinges on this, but if humans haven't inhabited earth for like, let's say a couple hundred years why has everything evolved to kill humans yeah i didn't get that yeah i didn't get that because that's what will smith specifically will smith says. says everything has evolved to kill you which we actually see is not true later on as evidenced by the bird yeah um yeah i don't know what that what that is i mean it's um i mean is it I a scare tactic no, I mean the whole the planet is rated F, you know, for don't go there yeah. or whatever. I yeah. mean it's a <laughs> super dangerous land. Yeah. No, I mean like is it like a government scare tactic? Like, oh, we can't go there because everything's going to kill you now. But really, like, ah, eh, you could probably go there. Well, yeah, but if when it they is, that's when, not clear in the movie. And when they do yeah, that no, in it's movies, not at all. it's usually because they're hiding something that's of some kind of value, you know, or whatever, and that's why they don't want you going yeah. there. Or they declared it, you know, like uh, off limits years ago, and in the intervening years it's actually fixed itself and now you go back there and you can breathe or whatever and like oh it's a new utopia um so maybe i mean i suppose that's the message of the movie is that i mean they all kind of have this environmental thing where it's like you know humankind will de eventually destroy its planet and then it's going to have to move to another planet which is a utopia but it's like well if your thesis is correct then they're going to destroy that planet too but whatever um, That's a common yeah. Scientology movie thing too. Yeah. Well, we better figure it out. We're about six months away from this happening. Yeah. <laughs> Just based on what's going on right now. So until the birds black out the sky with uh, there's going to be so many of them and tigers and the monkeys running and the monkeys. You. Were those chimpanzees? I think they were baboons. The baboons that are somehow in fair, the California redwoods. Terrifying. Sure. I, yeah, would, I would be scared shitless if, a, if like a horde of monkeys was chasing me. Did anyone see yes. that Astra? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Killer Terrifying. monkeys. Yeah. I mean, even the second Hunger Games movie had people being pulled apart by monkeys. That's mm -hmm. what this kind of feels like, a Hunger Games movie. It yeah. does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But not as good. No. No, not as good. Well, the whole thing seems very virtual, which is another like thing uh, maybe that uh, goes to that. I mean, I said it was I was being facetious when I said it was based on a, a non-existent video game. It feels it does like it's feel been like a video game because it's been plotted like one. Right. Mm -hmm. It's basically like uh, I mean, even the scene where they have to try and escape the gravitational like uh, whatever. What was it? There was like the ship itself is going through this asteroid field. It's going to set off some kind of explosion, an asteroid storm by, you know, uh, just its engines being there, which it does. And then it has to, like, warp out of that space. And I'm like, wow, this does look like something I've played in a video game. They crash yeah. land, and then it's like, you have to go here. And here's the path, you know, on the uh, holographic model where I'll show you where you have to go. You've got uh, four health packs that you here's have. Here's all your gear and what it does. Yeah. And then you discover yeah. things along the way and it has that kind of. Uh, you have side quests. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, this is. It's like space Tomb Raider. But I see this a lot now. It's like, you know, because obviously a lot of film writers are also either working in the video game industry or, you know, they've grown up with it now. And so you kind of have that bleed of, uh, it used to be the other way. It was film, video games were trying to take movie writers, come over and help us make our cutscenes better, you know, and bring the drama. Now it's going the other way where it's like, well, this works in a video game as a plot. So let's apply this to a movie. But it's like, yeah, but you're just setting up like, okay, uh, the whole planet's going to freeze at night for no good goddamn reason. Uh, you got to make it to these certain warm spots, you know, within 
the certain period of time that you have with the uh, the, the the health pack, whatever things he inhales, it coats his lungs. The inhalers, the, yeah. Uh, so you got to get there before it freezes, which I don't understand this either. If somebody can explain to me how the planet freezes every night in the daytime when the sun's still out, uh, but there's still vegetation everywhere. The vegetation just gets like little crystal snow coverings. It's evolved, I guess, like... That's the best I can come up with. But, but that's not but, how it works. I know. But it's like, yeah, the, Colin, would it surprise you if I told you Will Smith had planned for this to be like the next Star Wars and there was two tie-in novels released with it and that he had hoped to make a video game and TV series and like whole media platform based off of this? I think uh, I think James Cameron should uh, take a peek at After Earth and be and you know kind of hold back on the Avatar movies. No, but, but <laughs> here's the thing: point. I know none of you guys have seen Avatar, and you keep making me defend <laughs> that fucking movie. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep not seeing it just just because of you, Colin. Yeah, but, we're gonna keep doing it so much that Colin's gonna be like, next week on the Freak Show. I know. Yeah, I had thought about it, but I'm like, God damn, that's too <laughs> long. Three of us are all gonna be sick at the same time. Yeah, and you gotta no, wait until you can come back to my Colin basement and see it in 3D. Avatar to the Freak Show. But James Cameron. I think does this because I thought about Avatar a lot in this movie. Actually, there's similar scenes, you know, in uh, oh, with sure. the, the whole thing with the bird and, you know, flying off of cliffs. And um, but James Cameron, I mean, he, this is a guy who can actually deliver the goods story wise, character wise, structure wise that he also like obsesses over the uh, art department end of it, too. So it's like in this movie, I feel like I got the art department. And the story and characters are pretty thin, and Cameron can actually give you both, you know. So it's like Avatar is a better That's movie than true. After. I will, I will concede that. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, can we talk about the bird? I, I need to talk about the bird. Tell me about you the get bird. The bird off your chest. Well, when the first time I watched this movie, I was like, if he wakes up in that bird's nest, I'm gonna lose my, I'm gonna lose it. And he wakes up in that fucking bird's nest. And for me, that's, I don't know why it's just so funny. It's so funny to me that like he passes out at night when it's cold and wakes up inside this giant bird nest. And the like the bird is like his kind of only ally in this movie, which is really weird. And so he tries to save the bird babies from like this, like saber cat trying to get in the nest and I guess that bird sees that and recognizes that because later on the bird sacrifices itself by keeping him warm through the cold night and dies. Yeah. So that just disproves the whole th- thesis of this movie that not everything has evolved to kill humans on this planet. Yeah, I'm not sure what they were trying to go for there because, again, I saw that as like, okay, there's <laughs> clearly a message here uh, that maybe the, the I'm message not column reading. is, uh, hey, thanks. Hey, but hold on. Can I do my Jaden Smith impression real quick? Okay. <clears throat> this is Jaden Smith after he realized the bird sacrificed his life for him. Hey, thanks. <laughs> That's about Spot as much on. energy as he's giving this role. Okay, so <laughs> there, so me. let's talk a little bit about Jaden Smith in the role of Katai. Um, so here's, I mean, the kid's 14 years old, right? And obviously he wants to be an actor, minimal experience. So I'm like, I mean, do you give him leeway or is this a bad performance? I I give him leeway. I think it's bad, but I also give him leeway because he's 14. There's a lot of pressure on him and he's acting against no one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he's out on his own the whole time. And to be honest, the further into the movie it got, I was like, okay, you know, he's actually not doing that bad considering what he's given. Like the pressure put on him, I can't even imagine. Like, yeah, you have to be the second coming of Will Smith in a movie where you're acting against tennis balls and green screen. Like, yeah, I mean they're they're backing yeah. you up with a hundred and thirty million dollars, and you better not fuck it up. You know, I mean, yeah, that's- shoulders. And I'm sure Will Smith was right there directing his son every step of the way, making sure he knew that. It's like, don't fuck it up, yeah. kid. Yeah, exactly. And like, well, do you think back to when you were fourteen? Like, would you want the world watching you in a situation like this when you were fourteen? Right. The world would not want to watch me at fourteen. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah, I I don't know the. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's really cool if you get to do it. You know, I'm sure that he was. Uh, you know, 
Well, I guess, you know, he wanted to be emancipated. How many years after this? About a year after About this. a year. Okay. So this is probably, I bet you, yeah, it was probably tense. He's poking at it. Yeah. Um, but I think that. I just, I just keep picturing like, picture like a dad coaching your, your basketball team, but he's like really hard on you in front of the whole team. Like yeah. that's the atmosphere that I'm picturing for Jaden right now. Because Will Smith, like his character is an asshole in this movie. Yeah. I also wonder if like his motivation be- behind his character being like so stoic and being, you know, this military man, this no feeling robot kind of thing. I wonder if that was his be- his way of being like, do you see how lucky you are to have me as a dad? Oh, you could, could have this. <laughs> right. Oh, that seems like a real dad move, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. That's why I never get, you know, I never feel that those kind of characters are really believable in movies because, um, the the whole thing about being an actor in a film is you have to be able to convey a certain amount of emotion or you have to be able to show that your character is feeling emotion even though they're not capable of recognizing it themselves so i think that his portrayal is actually like you can read emotion all over that guy's face even though he's trying you know to struggle to keep it in and you know it's just his dialogue sounds very uh curt and uh you know, well, and they have by this the weird book. like future accent that is not helping either. I think yeah. that like you can't put that on a kid this young and this inexperienced. You know, was that? I was wondering what that was because I, I I I can't remember. I never saw Karate Kid. I did see Pursuit of Happiness, but I don't remember. But that's why I was like, does he have like a strange? I couldn't tell what that accent was. And then Will Smith was doing it too, and I'm like, what yeah. the yeah. hell are they? Why we, <laughs> we're gonna do such a a uh, crazy future world where the humans wouldn't speak the way that they would now, you know, the, the, the yeah, language would change a little future bit. Future accent, but everyone else is just doing their own accent, you know, yeah, like what... Tormund is doing his own. The two guys piloting the ship are doing their own thing. It's very strange. Um, mm-hmm. Will Smith, or uh, sorry, Jaden also, he, he always looks like he is about to cry. Uh, yeah, something about like, you know, he's, he's very good at that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like I don't know. He might be about to cry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> so it's it's that hard to read a, those like moments. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just like a default expression. I think whenever he's trying to be uh, focused and um, you know not concerned. What am I looking for when you're you're concentrating? Like yeah, determined, concentrating. He kind of knots his. Uh, his eyebrows together, but in his case, he looks, he looks a lot like his dad when he does that. Yeah, yeah, he does. But he constantly looks like, you know, I mean, if you, you kind of feel bad, it looks like a kid has been bullied his whole life or something like that. I'm like, is this what we're supposed to be thinking out of the, I mean, maybe that fits into it. I don't know. Um, into the theme of the movie. Uh, so he's going to try and win dad's approval. Basically he's got to go through all these trials, which are, um, you know, you getting far between and very boring. Well, he gets stung by a, a bug that sucks his blood and gives him uh, paralysis, and he has to administer the drug to get him out of that. He busts a couple of the the uh, air rebreather things, and he's got to come up at some point with his own way to connect the dots between, you know, I don't have enough air supply to make this, and, you know, so he has to think for himself. Um, eventually, when he does get to the crashed ship, we determine that the Ursa has gotten loose and is actually out there. And so this is the biggest danger that he's ever going to face. And so then the question becomes like, is he going to uh, be able to become a, uh, a ghost? Go clear. Yeah. Like his dad. Is he going to be able to do that? Well, he's also did you, troubled. Did you ever think at any point that he wasn't going to get there? No, but that's... this is why, this is why this is the problem I have with this movie. It's just like, I know exactly where it's going to go. He's going to get there. He's going to overcome everything. He's going to become his dad and make him proud. And that's it. Mm -hmm. I guess I just don't understand why, like, there's these two conflicts in this movie. There's the things on Earth that are coming after him and there's the Ursa. Why can't the ship just be wrecked and it be kind of like that alien isolation video game where you're just trying to get around the ship and the things loose in the ship? I don't understand why we have to have the whole Earth element at all. Because then it's like two he has two conflicts he's navigating, you know? Well, he's gotta survive all the shit on Earth and then fight the Ursa at the end. 
It was third conflict is uh, against his past. So what? What? There's flashbacks throughout oh the movie. What? Oh my what God. What's his back? This is the most. This. this is the most Shyamalan thing I think of this movie. The flashbacks. Okay. Yeah. That's got his fingerprints all over. It. Did you guys think it was hilarious that it seemed like the Ursa just kind of came and knocked on their door like a Jehovah's Witness and killed them? <laughs> well, I, I, he just walked into their house. <laughs> and they found they found an actor, a kid to, who looks nothing like Jaden Smith to be like young Jaden yeah. Smith, which I was like, who is this? You know, well, yeah. at least know give him a Jayden similar Smith haircut like or something. He was in movies already. Yeah. Use your CGI <laughs> face replacement and whatever. So that's why I wasn't quite sure who we were looking at. And then, um, yeah, so the idea is that somehow... Uh, at their house on Nova Prime. I don't know where that took so, place. Yeah, Zoe Kravitz puts him in a terrarium, says, Don't come out. And Ursa comes in and stabs her through the chest. And we see this flashback so many times. Right. Because this so is a many key times. moment. Because this is, uh, instead of being able to act, because he was three or whatever, and save his sister, who was, uh, you know, I mean, she's like a teenager and apparently a ranger. Because she's got the uh, cutlass, you know, the double-sided sword or whatever that uh, that the yeah, Rangers no have. Yeah, guns in this movie. Why are there no guns in this movie? I don't know. It's all swords and, like, cutlasses and knives. That's it. We finally got our gun control laws passed, Colin. That's why. But there's giant killer, like, alien <laughs> creatures coming at you. You'd I think. was wondering. I was wondering if it's because their new planet doesn't have the resources to make armed weapons. I don't know. But they I don't make, know. I feel spaceships. Like you can make spaceships like that. You can make yeah. guns. I was going to say, look at the technology of those spaceships. You can make a gun out of that. Yeah, they could do it. They just choose not to for an aesthetic position. Oh no! I wonder if it's one of those kind of like uh, you know when they're making the movie and they're like you know gun violence in the real world is a terrible. Yeah, thing. it's like it's probably a political <laughs> statement. Yeah, we're we're not going to use guns in our movie when it's like. This is a life or death situation, which I think could be solved if somebody actually had, um, you know, what a, a Rambo machine gun. Uh, you could <laughs> saw these Looking things down as gun, they're Colin? coming at you. Huh? If- Looking for that good guy with a gun? That's right. The 50 cal. Sean, right? Sean it made me think of the art of self-defense. <laughs> that, that would have been a, that would have been good. Right, <laughs> right there at the end, bam! It's more ninja-like, right? It's a more civilized method of combat, like the Jedi Order, right? You use uh, right. swords instead of uh, blasters. Cla- it's classier. It's classier, even though it it makes no damn sense. But okay, it's an aesthetic choice by the filmmakers. Yeah. All right. In this universe, it makes no sense. So uh, you should have rocket launchers in this universe. Yeah. And some kind of, yeah, some that's kind what of, this movie was lacking: rocket launchers. Yeah, you should have something to blow them away from a safe distance. I agree. Yeah, especially because they're uh, well. We're told in the beginning there's like packs of them, but of course there's just this one now on Earth that they brought with them that's running around that eventually is going to try and track the kid down. I didn't really get the threat level, um, even though they had talked this thing up throughout the entire movie by the time it shows up and it's you know yeah it's a it's a predator dog or whatever you know they, you see them all over the place in movies mm. they all look the same it's this gray creature with no eyes and big mouth and fangs and runs around in all fours right um but i really didn't get um that this was the big culmination of you know i mean first you know as we were saying like his backstory is basically setting him up to um, he's got to get out of the, out of the bowl, the terrarium bowl, right? He's still hiding in the terrarium yep. bowl and he has to, uh, just... yeah, I mean, it, it come out and actually act, you know, do something in order to save yourself, take an action, um, to change your position in life. That's what the whole thing is. There you go. Well, so, and that the, so the whole, the whole thing with Zoe Kravitz putting him in the terrarium to protect him and how Jaden and Will Smith kind of have that argument about like, oh, you blame me for her death. You think I should have done something, blah, blah, blah. That's a Scientology thing, 100 percent, because in Scientology, they believe children are just small adults and that they are completely responsible for their own actions and should be treated like adults. Yeah. So the, that whole argument, I was like, you cannot deny it right here. I see it. <laughs> Yeah, wow. for sure. That's pretty severe because that kid is, well, I said three, but, you know, he's, he's like 
He was little. Yeah, he's little, you know. Yeah, that's why so let's both of them. That's why in like the fucking Sea Org, they put kids to work like really young to do like actual manual labor. It's it's insane. They don't believe like childhood is a thing. They just think they're no. small adults. Yep. So yeah, th- when they had that argument, I was like, okay, you can deny it. You can maybe hand wave it away for the rest of this movie, but this one scene, it is definitely this is Scientology right here. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And she could have fit in that terrarium. They both could have gotten in there. Titanic <laughs> situation. Yeah, just like that. She chose to be a hero, though. Um, actually, double, double doubling back, back just a little bit here uh, about this bird. I mean, he enc- encounters all of these, um, you know, ferocious life forms. Except this the eagle. bird is like third build of this movie. Yeah, I don't. I, I, don't, uh, I don't. What is the? Uh, did we ever nail down like what the uh, the metaphor, the message is here? The the bird um, uh, tries to attack him, but he blacks out. When he wakes up, he's in the bird's nest, and then the the lions attack, and then he defends the tries to defend the eggs from the lions. So I guess the bird senses an ally or something or was already acting motherly towards him. And then yeah, uh, when it's freezing so. and he's about to die, uh, we see the bird show up and uh, and drag him to and builds a, a, a like a little habitat for him to keep him warm and shelters him with its body. And then he wakes up in the morning and the bird's dead. What What's the movie trying to say here? What's the what's the point of the symbolic sacrifice of the bird? I think, well, okay, the first time I saw this, I thought that, like, maybe that's what was going to happen to Will Smith's character, is that he would somehow, like, sacrifice himself to save his son, but that's not what happens in this movie, so I have no idea. I mean, it's a it's a beast, it's a natural, it's a predator that's decided that, like, even it could see, like, a kinship, and I don't know, okay. I'm, uh, well, is- like I said, that goes against the thesis of the movie that everything on this planet has evolved to kill humans. Yeah, I think because- I think it was a I think it was a parallel of Will Smith's character because I mean at first the bird is actually like attacking him and mid it, that's why it's chasing him and I think it brought it back to the nest it brought him back to the nest like with the intention of like feeding its family with him like I think yes. he was supposed to be food and and then eventually like becomes maternal and saves him and that's Will Smith's character this whole movie he's very like robotic very like I'm your was he a fucking general or whatever whatever he is. Like he's he's a military guy, and then at the end of the movie, he's paternal again. He's like giving him a hug, and he's crying, and it's it's a parallel with Will Smith's character evolving emotionally. We'll see. Then that's well, then, what that's what I took from it. So then we're I talking mean, about this is like symbolism. There is you know it's like okay, so it's symbolism if you're looking at the whole you know entirety of the of the piece. But it well, like what's it doing for the character? Like what's Jaden Smith? get out of this interaction what new knowledge does he gain he lives another day a new perspective yeah that's, that's why I, I don't get like what he got out of it how it changed his you know world view he said hey thanks colin did you not hear me thanks yeah i love that that bird sacrificed his life and that's all he has to say about it yeah yeah all right well he yeah. does i think he learns about love in that instance was that it? He's in, I think because he's never felt it before. Yeah. yeah. Do you think he's like this bird kind love of, me more than my dad does? That's kind what of, I'd be like yeah, after that. That's kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> like fuck you, dad. I'm going to live with the birds. Well, I I'm wondering if like maybe they thought that it was portraying him realizing that like even something with a hardcore exterior can be loving. And that he shouldn't give up on it on his dad loving it. It's very generous to this movie. Oh no! I I, 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 I am fucking reaching with this. We're all working too hard right now, Colin. I think you should have. I think you should have punched up the script because I don't think that thought ever crossed their mind. (laughs) Well, I don't. I don't put it past M Night Shyamalan. I mean, he seems like he's. uh, You know, he thinks in terms of birds. Don't you remember the fucking. Lady in the water, man's just a fan oh, of like God. loving birds. He loves hanging people from <laughs> trees too. Did you notice, like at the beginning when they showed the Earth like killing people, there was that shot of all the bodies hanging from the trees? Yeah, that's what. And my Shyamalan loves that imagery, man. It doesn't eat them; it just that, impales them on trees. Imagery, that imagery was like straight out of Three Hundred. Yeah, 
which I, which I believe came before that, right? Where all people hanging from the trees, or yeah. yeah. Um, well, what's Will Smith doing in this whole movie? I mean, like we're talking about, we've spent, you know, like whatever, a couple sitting. Okay. He's the guy in the chair. He's got a broken femur. Yeah. And so there's two broken legs. There's some, uh, he has to do a bypass on his artery at some point in order to, to save himself. And he sits there and takes medication. He's losing blood. He's coaching the kid. I don't know if we said this, but he's able to see and hear uh, everything that the kid's doing through like a remote link or whatever. So he's given his uh, command guidance uh, to the kid this whole time, relating stories about like, you know, how the first time that he uh, basically conquered his fear, um, you know, having these heart to heart. long ass story. Yeah. I imagine Holy in the, uh, in the, the, the version of the guys in plaid and the truck that crashes and, you know, whatever the hunter and his kid going out, that this is all happening on a, on like a seat, a walkie talkie or something in the low budget yeah. version of this movie. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, this is the diehard supposed to be the diehard, um, Al and, and John right back and forth. On the yeah. walkie talkie story. Yeah. Until but eventually they, the walkie talkie gets this? broke and then yeah, the kids on his own. This. Like, yeah. Sean, like you said, they flash back to literally everything else. They show Zoe Kravitz dying like four or five times. Yeah, yeah. why not flash back to this? Because it's a it, well, it's a stylistic choice by a director who's trying to do. They're trying to like the way that you hear stories is similar to the way he's doing it in that in this scene of the movie. It's trying to make it more human and relatable uh, because you're you're building the whole thing in your head, but you're actually just watching the actor talk. But usually, it helps if like. I mean, they did it great in Silence of the Lambs is one of the great ex- examples of this because they actually shot a flashback of Clarice saving the lambs. But then they were like the the performance of, uh, you know, of uh, Jodie Foster in the end of the camera was so fucking strong. And you like you got it all that they didn't want to cut away from it. I think that's the same thing that they're going for here. It's like if we just hold on, we're getting a human performance. But the only problem is your human is trying to like choke back all of his emotion and not actually yeah. show it. And then you've got the other kid who's, you know, the kid is just reacting to it and there's nothing for him to really react to. Cause you know, it's a mental picture that he's, you know, that he's building in his head about his dad yeah, surviving I mean, this. We, we've all seen, I am legend. We know Will Smith can act by himself and be emotional and be perfectly entertaining. Like we know he's capable of that, but this movie mm-hmm. just wants him to cut all that off. Yeah. Well, eventually, in the end, listener, we're going to spoil it for you. He does. Jaden Smith actually does become a ghost and conquers the his fear and the Ursa. Fear is just a choice. It turns. It's not a biological thing at all. You can just turn it off. You can just choose not to be afraid. Yep. And uh, the thing can't actually. Scientology for you. Yep. It can't see him, so he's able to kill it. He does rescue his dad. His dad survives. And they all live happily ever after. Yep. And they say, I want to go work with mom now. I thought that was a cop out (laughs) after all that. It's like finally, you know, (laughs) because they do these shots of like uh, the other soldiers, like watching the replay. I like that little moment where the the soldier is somehow watching the video feed of him defeating the uh, creature, which I'm not even sure that Will Smith had that ability at that point to actually see a video feed so like where'd the video feed come from but whatever uh and they kind of are like whoa this kid you're reading this in their face this kid took down an ursa he's a you know it's like they're building the legend like he has supplanted his dad as the next in line right at the end of the movie they give him that you are the next will smith yep yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> well all right uh i tell you what listener uh we're gonna go around the room we're gonna tell you whether or not you should watch after earth and what we thought of it we're gonna give it a review uh, but before that we're gonna need the help of igor our mailman to read some of your mail so igor bring us the mail Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. He's got a little color changing bodysuit on. Oh, yeah. Did we mention that? <laughs> that's just a skin. No, I was like, that's just hives. It happens. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. He's shedding, actually. <laughs> They're the turning color. black. 
That means there's danger nearby. <laughs> yeah, he's got a the kid's got a mood suit in this movie that uh, that it mood starts suit. off brown. It's one of, I never understand. You know, they just design these things because they look cool, but they serve no function that you can tell. It's got these raised three buttons or not three buttons, but little bubbles on it that are clearly just like foam latex rubber or whatever. And you're like, what are you supposed to press those? Are they just, what function do they serve? It's just, you're breaking Crazy up a shells. pattern by having those yeah. things there. I don't get it. But the, 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 the suit changes white when I think it's when his Did blood pressure his wipes his ass. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> Probably, uh, that's yeah. the dune suit. The, the dune suit you're supposed to crap in it and it reprocesses it and then feeds you the water from it somehow. That's the still suit. All right, we're done. We're done. Wait to see that. We're done. Mailbag, please. Yeah. Yeah. You never take the still suit off. We're just going to get a five minute shot of of Timothy Chalamet going. (laughs) 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 Yeah. But this one turns turns black when it turns into like a war mode, white when you're dying, and uh, it's brown, I guess, as uh, default camo, just earth and tone. It's like go. a fucking mood ring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's a mood suit. Mood okay. Suit. Well, uh, we want to tell people how they can get a hold of us. Uh, you can write in or follow us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or maybe Twitter's your thing. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And if you're an Instagrammer, we're there too. Saturday Night Freak Show. So, um... A listener named Owen writes in and says, so back in March, I found out that I contracted COVID-19 and had quarantined myself. It took me roughly 20 days of suffering and feeling hopeless. And some nights I was scared to sleep because I was afraid of not waking up. And one night before going to sleep, I decided to listen to your recent episodes and found comfort. It made me forget that I was sick and I rewatched a lot of classic horror films. And since then I've recovered. And this podcast was one of the benefits that helped me overcome being sick. So thank you. Freak show. That's really sweet. Thank that's you very really, much. Yeah. I, I hope I you're can't feeling even. better. Yeah. I hope you're feeling yeah. better. Holy cow. That's the, yeah. We hear the Nothing's horror more story. healing than old horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine our voices are that comforting. So I mean, I'll take your word for it, but I, I almost don't believe you. <laughs> I know. There might have been some hallucinations involved in this, too. There you go. I mean, look at Colin. He's made of silk. Made of what? <laughs> silk. Oh, silk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Pull a string and it all goes. Uh, about tonight's movie, After Earth, uh, Michael Whitaker wrote in and said, I have to admit, I was actually very interested in seeing this movie until all the bad reviews came out. I'll also admit that because his movies usually get filmed around where I live, I tend to grade, this is M. Night Shyamalan, movies on a curve. That must be Pittsburgh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Next to George Romero, M. Night Shyamalan's the most famous guy. Is it Philadelphia? Out. Is it Philadelphia? Right. I'm pretty sure it's Philadelphia. Okay. Well, they're both yeah. they're Pennsylvania mm-hmm. guys. Um, Robin Linneman Silverberg, when he found out that we were watching this movie, said, "Why? Just why?" <laughs> and Teresa Ann said, "Oh boy." <laughs> all right. I think we all said that. I think we all said that at some point during our group chat while watching it. Yep. Well, I'm pretty sure wasn't there a whole collective oh no at the end of last week's episode yeah. when, when you said we were watching this? Well, yeah, I thought, everyone, I thought, everyone deflated immediately <laughs> as soon as I mentioned it. But I thought this was a first timer for two of you. Yeah, it was for me. That. Okay. There's a reason I hadn't watched it. I can yeah. still say oh no because I had never planned on watching <laughs> to this. To be fair, movie. the trailer was good for this movie. It did have a good trailer. All right, about last week's episode, which was Congo, uh, Mark Zidane writes in and says, it's a lackluster movie based on a lackluster novel, a movie definitely pushed because of the success of Jurassic Park, but I will say the creature effects hold up. I remember when I was younger on the Discovery Channel, I had a show called Movie Magic and featured the creation and shoot of the hippo attack scene. Is this what you guys were talking about last? That was You said it was on HBO, First Look or something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they also did a feature... Of a previous episode, you did Virus. Uh, But in the end, uh, Congo's a bland movie with decent creature effects uh, and always over-the-top performance by the legendary Tim Curry. Will you stop eating my sesame cake? (laughs) That's a callback. (laughs) the best line of the movie. Yeah. Uh, About Bug, uh, Michael Whitaker wrote it again. He said, uh, perhaps now is the time for a new William Castle. With all the movie theater business being in such dire straits, maybe someone who could inject a little bit of fun back into the movie-going experience is what's needed. 
Okay. That'd be cool. Uh, Death by Stereo says, okay, so we posted a still from the movie Bug, which we were, this is not the one with Ashley Judd and Michael Shannon. This is the uh, the 70s one with uh, mutant cockroaches where they actually spell out we live on a wall at some point in that movie. Death by Stereo said, I was watching the Powerpuff Girls episode about cockroaches <laughs> and I opened my Instagram and this is the first thing I saw. <laughs> That's hilarious. I used to watch the shit out of Powerpuff Girls. Well, Nick Siebel, I love it. Uh, about our previous, previous episode, Invasion USA, Nick Siebel said, I just watched the 1985 Chuck Norris documentary, Invasion USA. This is the quintessential <laughs> Chuck Norris 80s action film. God bless Canon and Chuck Norris. Thanks, Sat Freak Show, for always coming through for your fans and stay safe. Yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, I think we've peaked with Chuck Norris stuff, so no need to bring anything else, Colin. Never again, Colin. No. <laughs> that was it. It's, you did it. There's no way it can be better. There's no. just no way. That may be true. May be true. That may may have been peak Chuck Norris. All right, so we're going to go. maybe uh, Forest Warrior. <laughs> about him turning into animals yeah <laughs> there's always silent rage okay. on the horizon okay uh, um so we're gonna go around the table and we're gonna tell you what we thought of tonight's movie which was after earth starting with sean hey thanks all right so i'm gonna go first <laughs> uh, because i'm gonna be done with this fucking movie um this uh whew, there's a reason i didn't watch it um uh, i don't like this movie, I'm at a loss for words for this movie. Um, it's boring. It's boring as fuck. Uh, I knew where it was going to go. I mean, he's obviously going to overcome his fear, rise up and, you know, uh, impress his dad and all that shit. So I'm not surprised where it went. Um, the monster is your basic, like, gray monster alien at the end. So that was cool. Um, I do not watch this movie. There's nothing in this. Um, I was bored. Um You'll be bored. Uh, it's unforgivable. I'm done. Pass. Pass on this movie. Who's ever next? I don't care. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll Holly, go. I'll go. Oh, oh, <laughs> Colin, you go next. Colin, you go. Um, well, I didn't hate it as much as Sean did. I mean, even the first time I saw it, it was like, okay, that's acceptable. I mean, M. Night Shyamalan is a capable director. I guess that's, uh, it, you know, what he brings to it. It's unfortunate that his career went the way that it did. And he became basically a director for hire. So it's like, okay, at least he brings the goods as far as, you know, being able to, you know, put the camera in the right place, you know, designing the thing. So it looks right. And, you know, so it's not like a hard movie to watch. It's just a kind of an unaccept, unaccept, uh, unexceptional movie, um, no, it is unacceptable, Colin. You know what I thought a lot of when I was uh, the other movie that came to mind, aside from Avatar. I know you guys are saying Lord of the Rings because there was some Lord of the Rings imagery. Obviously, we got to go to the volcano at the end, and the light shoots up through the atmosphere and all this. Um, I thought about the Tom Cruise movie Oblivion, um, which oh, seems probably to be, more Scientology context. I'm sure. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> Tell you the truth. We find another one and just collect them all together and call it the Sign Trilogy. But I think they yeah, would be Battlefield like Battlefield Earth. They would be There's like uh, well, Battlefield we Earth That's is true. Battlefield Earth is actually like a, a a bad bad movie. These ones aren't bad, and I think Oblivion's probably a little better than After Earth. Um, it's just yeah, I mean, it's an action movie without a whole lot of thrills. Uh, it's not it's not something that you've really uh, that you have seen a bunch of times before. So it's not like distinguishing itself in that way. Uh, it's got Will Smith in it, but he's not doing Will Smith stuff. I mean, he's not really the focal centerpiece. He's not really delivering like a, uh, you know, I guess the char the charisma that you expect from Will Smith. He's playing against that. And I don't think that uh, Jaden Smith, you know, I mean, I got nothing against the kid. I just don't think that he has the goods to be like a leading um man and i suppose that's why it feels like the movie kind of has that um the tinge of nepotism you know it's like well the only reason you got this job is because your dad you know is will smith you know um uh but uh i don't know would i recommend it to you it's like i mean if i was just giving it a straight review right out of four stars i'd maybe go like two and a half or three it's like 
you know, it's a perfectly acceptable movie, but of the galaxy of stuff that's out there, what I recommend it to you, it's like, do you need to see After Earth? I, I don't think you do. Sean's going to punch you through the camera. Right <laughs> I really am. Tom, no. what are you doing? No, I, well, I'm saying I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend... Uh, I wouldn't recommend that you necessarily seek it out. I'm saying if you if you watch it, it's not uh, you know offensively bad. And I guess I wasn't bored either. I've seen it twice now, so I wasn't bored. So you know it's on the edge of a passing grade, but I'd say ultimately now you can skip after Earth. Let's go with Holly because she's the only one left before Michaela who picked the movie. <laughs> Um, Colin, wow, I think three stars is very generous for this movie. Holy yeah. cow. We just spent an hour. Wait, that might, sorry, that was out of five. That was out of five. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, That's two. still generous. Let's that go. Still generous. Still too generous. Yeah. Out of four, we're going to go That's, two. Two two stars out of four. Changing my mind. I, I think yeah. three out of ten is more appropriate. It's yeah, for real. Bad. What is the IMDb ranking of this? Yeah, I, didn't, I, I think guess, it's like a six, like I everything on IMDb. Okay. Holly. Yeah. I, no, I, I think, you know, when you said it's unexceptional and I totally agree, there is nothing memorable or even like for, for as high of a budget as it had, the special effects are nothing to write home about. There's nothing spectacular about this movie at all. The writing is shit. The acting is not great. Uh, the story doesn't make sense in the long run because there's, there's all these like allegories that just don't jive it doesn't really come together in a in a fluid way like it just doesn't really it, it's not cohesive it's it's just it's dumb this movie was dumb it's <laughs> just, like, I, saw, I saw on your face you're just like it's stupid it's just stupid. it is it's just stupid like 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 you were saying earlier like everything was just unbelievably predictable the whole movie was like i'm not impressed by anything and i know exactly what's happening and i'm bored and there's no saving grace to this movie. I don't know why you would recommend it to anybody. It sucked. I, I, I didn't can't. recommend it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, you're you're saying you, yeah. The royal you, Colin. Yeah, okay, the royal you. But you did say, you were like, am I, if, I, if I'm just, you know, talking about the, am I, would I recommend it? Maybe you were on the fence because yeah. you were like, I might tell someone to watch this movie. Who? Who are you going to tell to watch this movie? You wouldn't tell anyone to turn it off, is what you're saying. Yeah, if it was on yeah. TV, you'd be like, it's fine. That's exactly no, it. Fine. I wouldn't tell anybody it's to it's watch it. Fine. There are better ways to spend your time. Okay. Don't spend it on this movie. No. Pass. Hard, hard pass. No. Never again. Michaela. Yeah, so I brought this just because I thought it was a convergence of interesting things, not because I thought it was a good movie. I thought it was interesting that Will Smith, M. Night Shyamalan, and Scientology all met up for a movie and still couldn't make it successful. But, you know, it, it's it's the Scientology Avengers, and they still failed, you know? I see why you brought it. I yeah. do. Yeah. Um, I think if you're interested in Scientology and how it sneaks its subtext into our media, then and you're going to write a paper on it or something, this is a great source to cite. Um, it's definitely not awesomely bad. It's definitely not entertaining. I laughed out loud at the bird's nest scene and at the hey thanks. I thought those were hilarious, but like it, it's not worth it to watch just for those two things. It's, it, it feels like you're, you're playing a video game that you, that you have like no control over. It would be a much better video game than a movie. I think um, so yeah, it's kind of like watching someone else play a video game and they're making all the wrong choices and you're like, just give me the controller. <laughs> this is, this is your, this is kind of your, your sub theme for your movies. Like, I, know, I, was, like was this, I was like, was this your follow up to serenity? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe you should double feature this with serenity though and really lose your mind altogether. <laughs> but would you believe it if I told you this movie was only an hour and 40 minutes? Yeah. Was it? Yeah, it feels like it's over two hours, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first thing I checked when I turned this on. I'm like, if this is over two hours, I'm going to be upset. It, it, I'm I'm kind of shocked that a movie like this is under two hours, honestly, because right now it feels like it's illegal to make a movie like this under two hours. Yeah. yeah. This is what, 2013? But, yeah. Yeah. They so hadn't quite breached that point then. yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's not a good movie. It's boring. Um, the. It, the things you go to see Will Smith for are not in this movie, which is just like, what's the fucking point if he's not going to be the charismatic, lovable Will Smith? It kind of sheds a better light on other movies where, like, maybe the movie isn't good, but he's good in it, at least. 
Um, Cause he's mm-hmm. not even good in this. I really don't understand this as being a passion project for them. Um, it, this just seems like, if you told me, like if it came out that this was just like a tax shelter for everyone involved, I'd be like, well, now it makes way more sense. Like, yeah. But it's, it's not good. It's boring. Uh, the context around it is interesting, but maybe like just read up on that. Don't watch the movie, but just read up on like how it was made and how like, what's it like to work with your dad when he's pressuring you into a career you don't want? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, it's an but, island of Dr. Moreau situation. Right, exactly. Like, oh man, if they made like a documentary about the making of this movie, I would watch the shit out of that <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Just to hear Will Smith be like, shut up, M. Night Shyamalan, my kid's trying to do something, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> my kid's going to be a star. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, there's just like all the things you would expect to be good about this movie are not good. And it's it's pretty misleading in that aspect. So yeah, don't watch it. It's not good. I just thought there were some interesting things to talk about around this movie. And it was a colossal failure. Um, so yeah, don't watch it. There's no reason really to watch it. Yeah. Unless you have a podcast. and <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Hey, what, what if we greenlit the sequel just by all of us renting it this week? Yeah, right. Yeah, like what's what's this interest? After, yeah, after Amazon, Earth. Amazon Prime got really confused today. <laughs> what was that? Um, after Earth AE or oh, Titan AE, right? Titan AE. Titan AE. Okay, yeah. there you go. There's the other. Um, okay, well, that's a unanimous pass on After Earth. So next week we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by Colin. Colin, redeem us. What are uh, we watching next week? All right. Well, we're gonna go. We're gonna go um, with. We haven't had like a good splatter movie on this, so this may be kind of rough. I don't know, like where your tolerance is on this. Uh, we're gonna go back to Italy for the Godfather of Gore, the Sultan of Splatter. We're gonna put Lucio Fulci on the Wall of Fame, and we're gonna watch City of the Living Dead, aka Gets Gates of Hell, which I think is coming out on Blu-ray from somebody really recently. So there you go, zombies. City of the Living Dead next week on the Saturday okay. Night Freak Show. All right. All right. Well, until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark. <laughs> <laughs>